Hey, I'm Sapphire. Wanna hear something scary? Don't look at her or speak to her. She isn't human. We live in the age of information. Answers to everything and anything are available to us in an instant. And yet, there are still so many things in this universe that cannot be explained. In these next few chapters, I'll be sharing the most puzzling, creepiest, unexplainable events that really happened. From unsolved crimes to common paranormal experiences. Our first story is about a young woman who checked into the Cecil Hotel and never checked out. The Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles has been around since 1927, and since its doors have opened, it has had a very dark history. At one point, it housed famed serial killer Richard Ramirez, who murdered his victims in his hotel room. There have also been numerous incidents of guests jumping out windows and other unsolved deaths, just like the one I'm about to tell you. In January of 2013, a young woman named Elisa Lamb flew to Los Angeles from Canada and checked into the Cecil Hotel. She was first placed in a hostel-style room, which she shared with another guest. But after two days, the front desk got a call. Hi, I'd like to make a complaint. The woman I'm sharing a room with is acting very odd. I don't feel comfortable. Is there any way you can move her? So Elisa was moved to a room of her own, and that was the last time anyone saw her. During her trip, she kept in frequent touch with her parents back home. But when they didn't hear from her when she was supposed to be leaving Los Angeles, they became worried and called the LAPD. Around the same time, the front desk kept getting more complaints. The water pressure in the shower is so low. The tap water is all black. So a hotel staff member went up on the roof to inspect the water tanks. He noticed that one of them was open. He looked inside, and that's when he found Elisa floating in the tank. To this day, nobody knows how she got in there undetected. But there are a lot of theories. See, Elisa had bipolar disorder and depression and was on prescription medication to help keep her in balance. She kept a blog where she wrote about her struggles with her illness and seemed to be very open about it. The most logical conclusion is that Elisa was off her medication, broke from reality, and drowned herself in the water tank. Another theory is that she was playing the elevator game. The elevator game is a ritual that originated on a Korean website. When performed properly, you can supposedly be transported to another dimension. In order to play, you need a building that has at least 10 levels. It's best played at night since you need to be completely alone. You enter the elevator and go to different floors in a particular order. Once you reach the fifth floor, a woman will get on with you. Whatever you do, don't look at her or speak to her. She isn't human. When you reach the 10th floor, you exit the elevator and enter a new dimension. You will still be in the hotel, but only you exist. Be careful. In this dimension, your cell phone won't work and you may feel disoriented and even faint. If you wake up without taking the proper steps to come back to our world, strange things may happen. So what does the elevator game have to do with Elisa Lam? After news spread of her bizarre death, a surveillance video from one of the hotel elevators went viral. It showed Elisa acting very oddly in an elevator, pressing random buttons, talking to seemingly nobody. Was she playing the elevator game? The Cecil Hotel has since rebranded itself to stay on Main. They can change their signs, but they can never change what happened within its walls. This isn't real, this isn't real, this can't be happening. We've all had horrific nightmares at some point in our lives. And just when it feels like there's no hope for you, you wake up safe in your bed. But what if waking up wasn't enough? What if the demon was still there? In this next chapter, I will be sharing a true experience that a friend of mine had. So Mike was attending law school and lived by himself in an apartment in Fullerton, California, apparently one of the most haunted cities in Orange County. In the first few months of living there, he started seeing things and feeling things. When he watched TV, it felt like someone was watching him. When he'd walk into a room, he'd see someone standing there just before he turned the lights on to find the room empty. Living alone is probably just messing with me, he thought to himself. Then one Friday night, Mike was washing dishes in his kitchen when he suddenly got the very strong feeling that someone was standing behind him. 
He looked in the reflection of the butter knife he was washing. It was his grandmother. She had died five years before. She looked incredibly concerned and was pointing towards the door. He turned around, but there was no one there. Creeped out, he decided to spend the weekend at a friend's place. When he came back home on Monday, he had forgotten about his grandmother's visit. And later that night, he had a terrible dream. He found himself in a dark alleyway, face to face with this woman, whose face was completely covered in shadows, and yet he could still make out her black eyes. She kept pointing toward this old building in the distance, like she wanted him to follow her there, but he kept hearing his grandmother's voice in the back of his head. Leave! Get out! So he started to back away from the shadow-faced lady. Then she lunged at him, grabbing his wrists so tight that they stung, like cold knives. The moment she touched him, Mike could somehow see all the evil things she had done in her past. He managed to kick her off of him just as he woke up. His heart was racing and his wrists were still stinging. Before he could catch his breath, the shadow-faced lady appeared again, grabbed his wrists and pulled him out of bed. This isn't real, this isn't real, this can't be happening, he kept thinking to himself. He threw her off of him and she slammed into the couch so hard that it moved out of place, along with some other furniture. Slowly, she stood back up, looked at him with her soulless eyes, winked, and began to vanish from her stomach outward. He fell back onto his bed. He lay there awake until the sun rose. Still in disbelief, he sat up and looked over at his living room furniture. Everything was still knocked out of place. It definitely was not a dream. He went to the church, got some blessed crosses, and placed them around his apartment. The woman never appeared again. To this day, he isn't sure what attacked him that night, but he knows that his grandma was trying to warn him. Who are the people they were talking to? Our whole lives, we've been taught to believe that time is a line, constantly moving forward and never looking back. But what if we're wrong? Just because science hasn't found a way to make time travel possible, doesn't mean nature hasn't. All over the world, there have been accounts of people experiencing time slips, the phenomenon where one is all of a sudden temporarily transported to another period of time. In this chapter, I'm going to share two real life incidents of this bizarre occurrence. Bold Street in Liverpool, England has become notorious for time slips. One theory is that the city is built on sandstone, which creates a strong magnetic field and can affect the human mind. Whether that's the case or not, something strange happened in July of 1996. Frank, an off-duty officer, was shopping with his wife in Liverpool. Frank ran into an old friend and so he stopped to say hi to him, while his wife continued without him and headed towards Dylan's, a large bookstore. After they had their chat, Frank said farewell and headed toward Dylan's on Bold Street. The store was right across the street from him when he noticed something was different. The sign now read, Crips. That can't be right, he thought to himself. He took a step closer and jumped back just as a box fan raced past him. Frank was surprised by how old fashioned it was. And that's when he noticed the people. Everyone was dressed as though it were the 1950s all over again. Did I walk into some sort of parade? Why is everyone dressed like this? He continued walking towards Dylan's, or at least where he thought Dylan should be. When he got up to the store windows, he didn't see books like there should have been, but women's handbags and clothes. Frank began to feel confused. Did I go the wrong way? What is happening? Then he noticed a young woman wearing a lime green tank top. Amidst all the poodle skirts and suits, she looked extremely out of place and that made him feel safer. She walked inside the store and he decided to follow her. The moment he stepped inside the store, he was surrounded by books. It was a bookstore. He was so startled that he grabbed the young woman's arm. Did you see that? He asked. Yeah, I thought this was a new women's clothes store. My mistake. And she left the store before he could ask her any questions. Frank's wife came over to him. Are you okay? Something really weird just happened. After doing some research, Frank learned that Crips was indeed a women's clothing store that existed in that exact location in the 1950s. He had no previous knowledge of that store. So if he was imagining things, that's a pretty big coincidence. 
There are countless stories of people having similar experiences, and I'll admit, I wasn't a believer until my friend told me what her grandmother and aunt experienced. They were on their way to Myrtle Beach when they stopped by a gas station. It was very authentically retro, though they did find it a little peculiar that everyone around them was dressed in an older fashion. While they were filling up their tank, the other customers struck up friendly conversation with them. They left the station, and when they got to the beach, they told their friends about the adorable gas station they stopped at. So on the drive back, they were just about to point it out when they realized it wasn't there. Instead, it was just an old gas station that probably hadn't been operating for years. How could they have both imagined the same thing? How did they fill up their gas? Who were the people they were talking to? Be gone, Satan! Children can have pretty wild imaginations. So no one bats an eye when a kid starts playing with an imaginary friend of theirs. They'll tell you all about their exciting adventures, and you smile and nod and say, oh, that's great, honey. But sometimes, those stories can be oddly specific and detailed. What I'm about to tell you is a true story that happened to a family friend. Decades ago, a baby was born in a small village in the Philippines, two months earlier than she was expected. Because she was so small, they nicknamed her Baby. Baby and her older cousin were very close, practically sisters. When Baby was about four years old, she would go off on her own a lot. Where were you? Her cousin would ask her. She was about seven at the time. Playing with Sven, she'd reply. Who's Sven? My friend. Her cousin assumed it was an imaginary friend because they lived in a very small village up in the mountains and she was pretty sure there were no children named Sven nearby. But she did find it a very odd name choice. So what did you and Sven do? We went in his flying machine with a spinning top. It makes a lot of noise. We flew in the sky and went over the water. Sounds fun, her cousin replied. She had no idea what she was talking about. The next time baby disappeared, it was for a longer period of time than the last. And where were you today? With Sven. He has these clothes that you wear underwater so you can breathe and you don't get wet. I saw lots of pretty fish. Sounds fun. Again, she had no idea what she was talking about. Then one day, baby and her cousin were walking down the street and baby pointed at a tree. That's Sven's house. He took me to visit his mom and dad. They have a really nice house and they have this snake and he can paint really pretty designs with his tongue on these plates. And that's when her cousin knew something wasn't right. See, some Catholics believe that the snake is a sign of the devil. And so she went to baby's mom and told her all about baby's stories. They must be Encantos, baby's mother said. Encantos are the enchanted ones, beings that only show themselves to people they like. Baby didn't have books or TV to give her the type of details that she was saying in her stories, so her family believed that she must be possessed by some sort of spirit. They decided that Baby needed to be taken to the church to receive the rite of exorcism. Thanks to horror movies, exorcisms have been portrayed as rituals to expel demons that are possessing a human being, but they were also performed to protect an individual who might be susceptible to the devil. Be gone, Satan, inventor and master of all deceit, enemy of man's salvation. After the ritual, Baby no longer went missing for periods of time. When asked about her friend Sven, she had no idea what anyone was talking about. Did she grow out of a face? Or did the ritual actually remove something from her? Years later, when Baby's cousin was much older and was living in the US, she saw a National Geographic magazine for the first time and that's when she saw the flying machine with a spinning top and the clothes for being underwater. If you asked her today, Baby has absolutely no recollection of those adventures she went on or her friend Sven, but her family sure does. So if Baby wasn't friends with Anne in Kanto, how does she know about helicopters and wetsuits? Things she had never seen before. Who or what? would have done such a thing. There are some creatures so powerful and malicious that even speaking about them will make you their target. That's why so little is known about the Skinwalkers, the legendary creatures of the Navajo Nation. Yi Naldushi, another name for the Skinwalkers, 
translates to he who walks on all fours. They are said to be witches who have gained the power to shapeshift. They will wear the skin of the animal they wish to take the form of, and once the transformation is complete, they will have the strengths and powers of that animal. But this isn't done just for the fun of it. The intent of the skinwalkers is pure evil. They can use mind control on their victims to make them hurt others and themselves. One of their initiation rituals is to murder a family member. It is also said that if you make eye contact with a skinwalker, it will absorb your soul and steal your body. This may seem like another urban legend, but to the Navajo, it is very real. In 1878, about 40 people were purged by tribe members who accused them of practicing malevolent witchcraft. And then, there is the curious case of Sarah Saganitso. In June of 1987, Sarah was working the night shift at the Flagstaff Medical Center in Arizona. It was her first time working the late shift and her family became worried when she didn't come home. They went to the medical center the following morning and that's when they found the body of a woman whose face was so bruised she was almost unrecognizable. But they knew that it was Sarah. Her torso had numerous stab wounds and her left breast appeared to have been bitten off. There was also a broken stick oddly left on her neck as well as a clump of grass from a graveyard in the distance found near her car. Who, or what, would have done such a thing? The police believed it was George Abney, a former professor at Northern Arizona University. He had apparently been telling his friends about strange dreams he had been having, where he was witnessing Sarah's murder. I was receiving prophecies from God, he said. But his defense lawyers had another theory. That broken stick, the clump of grass, this is the work of a skinwalker. Nobody was buying this defense, and George was found guilty. However, a year later, his case was reopened by Sarah's family. They believed he was truly innocent, and George was acquitted of all charges. He apparently even became a close family friend to the Saganitos. So did George take advantage of the Navajo's belief in the skinwalkers to get away with murder? Or was he in fact innocent? Until there is definitive proof, I guess this will just be another unexplainable event. Do you believe skinwalkers are real? Let me know in the comments. But be careful, you might be drawing their attention to you. Like this video if it gave you the chills, and don't forget to subscribe to Snarled and check out our other videos. Until next time, Sweet dreams.